a hearty congratulations to our next guest because his book that we've been talking about um, is finally out where all books are sold. It's called Playmakers, How the NFL Really Works and Doesn't. Mike Florio of Pro Football Talk right here on the Rich Eisen Show, Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line. How are you, Mike? I'm doing great, Rich. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Congrats. How's the book tour doing so far? Well, when I advocated with the publisher to release the book during the week of free agency because that's our busiest time of the year. Yes. And we can sell the most books, and it makes sense. Let's sell a football book when it's not football season, because in football season, who cares? They're watching football. So it all made sense to have this book out there, our busiest week of the year. And then it dawned on me yesterday, this is our busiest week of the year. This is not the ideal time to be trying to sell a book on top of everything else we're doing. So a lot of caffeine has been consumed this week, and uh, we just get through it. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to be on your show as Thank part you. of this media tour because we're doing like 30 of them this week. But it's great because you just pick up the phone or you go log on to your laptop and you, you click the Zoom button. I think it's uh, uh, a, a great thing to write a book and uh, have it on a shelf forevermore. The proverbial, no one can ever take it away from you, although I don't know who's ever tries to take something away from somebody it. in the history of this cliche. <laughs> gonna, they can never take away the thing that they wouldn't want. <laughs> Right. So, uh, again, congratulations on that. Playmakers where all books can be acquired. Um, And so let's let's jump into Baker Mayfield right here. And, you know, the Browns have every right to upgrade their position. Mayfield has every right to say what gives Um, his play in year four did not merit a long term deal. Uh, One is not coming. And instead, the team is talking to Deshaun Watson. How real is it? that Watson might be going or thinking about Cleveland? Well, I don't know about what Watson wants, and this really is set up for Watson to be able to pick which team he wants. There were multiple reports last night which tell me someone wanted this out there, that before anyone could sit down with Watson, Rich, they had to be basically pre-approved by the Texans as it relates to the trade package that would have been given or will be given to Houston for Watson, which allows Watson to now just say, here's where I want to go, and there's nothing to be done. The trade is in hand, and you go forward. So it's going to come down to how he feels about the Saints, Panthers, Browns, Falcons, where he wants to go out of those four teams. I don't know. I kind of like the idea of the Browns, but at the same time, I don't like the idea of the AFC or the AFC North. So it's really going to come down to where he's comfortable and where he wants to go. But I think that the bigger issue here, because at first I thought, wow, this is gutsy of the Browns to go all in for Watson because if they don't get him, they got a problem with Baker Mayfield. I've reached the point now where I conclude that this is the first step toward the divorce from Baker Mayfield, that the real message is they've decided to move on. Because for a guy like Mayfield, you can't even start down this path unless you're ready to finish. And I think they're ready to, to say Baker's out and we're going in another direction. And if it's Deshaun Watson, great. And if it's not... That's fine, too. We're going to find somebody other than Baker Mayfield. And it all comes down to erratic play and contractual expectations. And if he would have a great year in 2022, Rich, because every other year he's good. If he, he's due for a good year, high-level analytics, every other year he's good. Right, like Brett Saberhagen year. back in the day. Yeah. Right. Um, but but if, if that happens, you get back into a corner, you've got to give him $40 million a year, and then you're the Rams after 2023 saying, what do we got to do to get rid of Jared Goff? So I think they're, they're being very smart about where this goes. There's no good way out of this. If he's good this year and you have to give him the contract he wants, you're constantly worried when's he going to backslide. So let's just be done with it now. Let's rip the Band-Aid off and let's move on. And I think that's what they're in the process of doing. And that's why Mayfield is sending out the um, preemptive farewell for a breakup that hasn't happened yet. You know? Rich, I'm, and I heard you earlier. I had a flashback to – the first time I was ever on the air with you, it was me, you, and Shefty in Tampa. Yeah, and Glazer. Pre-Super Bowl, mm-hmm. early 2009, we were talking about Donovan McNabb, and I said that McNabb's play is, I am breaking up with you. That's the move that Mayfield may be trying to <laughs> do here. The old, that was the advice that Kramer gave to Costanza. Remember Noel, and they had the Pez dispenser when she was doing her, her uh, recital, and she was upset about that, and it was Elaine's laugh. It was, I am breaking up with you, and that may be what Mayfield's trying to do, because Look, I, just, I think it's over. It's just a matter of time, and it's going to be fascinating to see where he goes and who the Browns end up with if it's not Deshaun Watson. Well, because then Mike Florio here, author of Playmakers and the PFT 
live host as well as profootballtalk.com creator and owner. And so the question is I have for you, sir, is if Watson doesn't come, you're saying that the the Browns are willing to put themselves potentially in the category of what the Colts are in right now or Seattle is in right now and willing to see with Amari Cooper and his 20 million bucks and whatever else they're going to put together uh, on this offense to see if Case Keenum might go and do it, right? Which, as you know, Stefanski knows firsthand. Uh, is that the the Browns' way of, of going into this Lamar and Burrow top-heavy division, you think? Well, I think Keenum would be the fallback if they can't find somebody between Keenum and Watson. And my guess is they've got a plan. You know how the Browns are, and John D. Podesta, and you, but we've, we've got a plan for everything, and it's all analytics, and they're going to move from this guy to this guy to this guy. But Keenum and Stefanski working together in Minnesota got to the brink of the Super Bowl in 2017. And, you know, the one thing that I think is easy to lose sight of because we're not privy to everything that goes on behind the curtain, but we've seen enough in front of the curtain from Baker Mayfield to come to the reasonable conclusion that he may be a little bit of a pain in the ass for the Browns, <laughs> right? And they may have gotten to the point where they've had enough. And there's been enough flashes of it that we've seen over the past couple of years. And the Browns try to be very professional and keep it out of sight. But, but you know, and Mayfield's got – I like that aspect of his personality. There's a point where you've got to turn it off. Or you've got to be so good that you overcome that element of your overall makeup. Like Aaron Rodgers is a pain in the butt, but he's, he's good enough that the Packers are going to tolerate it. Mayfield's not so good that the Browns are going to tolerate it. So – I'd go with Keenum because Keenum's not going to give you a problem and he's going to play at a sufficiently high level and the offense doesn't run through the quarterback anyway. It probably will if they get to Sean Watson, but they can just run the ball and Keenum can do his thing and they'll see if they're competitive and they keep looking for a quarterback if that's their worst-case scenario. My guess is they have plans that, you know, go for – I mean, if Keenum is plan D and Watson is plan A – We'll see what plan B and plan C may be. So just to put a button on the the Watson conversation, Mike Florio. So the way this is working is similar to what? uh, Buying a house or getting your your mortgage done is that you need pre-approval by the bank. And that's the Texans by saying, here is you need to apply. Let's see on your application, your your, uh, compensation for us to trade you to Sean Watson. And then, then, or, or is Watson the bank saying that uh, I, I will not uh, grant you this uh, loan or this mortgage because I don't want to come to you? Uh, are the Texans and Watson, after all this time, finally working in concert? Is that well, what's I happening? I think they are. And you know what? I, I love a good metaphor, but this is basically Aaron Rodgers without the Packers trying to conceal the notion that a situation has been engineered where the quarterback is picking a team that the Packers allowed, I believe, his agent David Dunn to set up potential trades. The terms are in place. The compensation is in place. And all Aaron Rodgers has to do is pick his next team. But the Packers were one of the options, and that's the team he picked. For Watson, same approach. We know about it, but the Texans aren't on the menu. It's going to be one of these four teams that we know about and whoever else may come to the table. But you know, I, I know there was talk yesterday of the 49ers in play. I don't think anybody else could really be in play secretly. There's too many moving parts. Too many people have to know about it for it to be kept a secret. So you have to be prepared if you're going to make this play for Watson that people are going to know about it. And then I guess the legal aspect of it is, I mean, didn't he have depositions taken civilly yesterday? I mean, uh, uh, the minute that no criminal, uh, that, that, that no bill came back from the grand jury last Friday, that, that's all teams needed to pretty much know. They figure everything else can be handled. There's, there's no a problem calculated risk there and not getting indicted on nine criminal complaints means only that he didn't get indicted it doesn't mean he didn't do it it doesn't mean that he is free and clear and faces no legal jeopardy in the civil system there's 22 lawsuits that have to be resolved he's either going to have those cases settled maybe he gets a dismissal of some of them he may have to go to trial on some he could win he could lose i don't know when the league is going to take action the league has learned in recent years that it's best to wait until the last possible minute to do anything. And maybe they defer action on Watson's situation until these civil cases are over. And really, Rich, if he would, if he would take all 22 of them to trial and win every one of them, and he didn't get indicted, what does the league do? What can the league do at that point? Is it a violation of the personal conduct policy if you have been aggressively pursued in both branches of the justice system and prevailed 
in every outcome. I, I don't know. I don't know. We, 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 may, we may find out eventually. But uh, I, I, think so, I think what's happened is, and this has worked very well to the benefit of the Texans and, the Watts, and, and Deshaun Watson, over the weekend, this market kicked up. And I think you've got teams that are saying, you know what, whatever the short-term pain is, whatever the PR hit may be, whatever, whatever we may have to deal with in 2022, we're going to have a franchise quarterback for 10 years. And winning cures everything. One of the chapters in Playmakers talks about how quickly Ben Roethlisberger was redeemed in Pittsburgh. By what? By winning. And I think the teams that want Watson are betting that he's going to go there and he's going to play so well that this is all going to be forgotten. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, Hmm. but we've seen it play out before. Mike Florio here on the Rich Eisen Show. What happened with Randy Gregory and the Cowboys and the Broncos on Tuesday? Very simply, and I'll try to be as succinct as possible, (laughs) Monday night he was ready to do a deal with the Broncos. The Cowboys got involved. The Cowboys talked him into sticking around. The Cowboys were willing to match what the Broncos were going to pay. The Cowboys previously weren't going to go that far, but then came the contract. And There's language in every contract that will result in future guaranteed money being voided. And for most teams, if not all teams but the Cowboys, it's tied to being suspended. The Cowboys, for every player except Dak Prescott, will wipe out future guarantees if you're simply fined under the substance abuse policy. That's one of the examples, and that's pertinent for Randy Gregory because he's had multiple substance abuse policy issues. So as relates to Gregory, $28 million guaranteed, $14 million paid this year, $14 $14 million base salary next year fully guaranteed. In Dallas, the risk he was taking if he agrees to their contract is written. If he has any fine under the substance abuse policy between now and September of 2023, they can wipe out the guarantees and they can cut him. And those guarantees save guys' jobs all the time. Ezekiel Elliott's still on the Cowboys because he's got a $12.4 million fully guaranteed salary this year. If that wasn't guaranteed, he's gone. It's over. It's done. So Gregory's protecting himself. And Peter Schaefer, who represents Gregory, told me on the record that they gave the Cowboys a chance to remove that language and do the same deal that the Broncos do, and they declined. So if they're mad at anybody, Rich, they need to be mad at themselves. Hmm. So what is the Cowboys' plan, do you think? I mean, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they kept Tank Lawrence. Amari Cooper's gone. They signed Gallup. Cedric Wilson is now a Dolphin, which I think is a sneaky, terrific signing by Miami. And so, um, you know, Zeke's still there. Pollard's still there. They franchise Dalton Schultz. What do you What do you think the plan is here with the team? You know, on a on a coach on and everyone on uh, uh, on a contract year. What's Dallas's deal? Do you think, well, and it's overall? funny you mentioned the Dolphins and Cedric Wilson. I I don't want to wake up two and on, but I love the Teddy Bridgewater signing. It's a sneaky under the radar. Two and on. We could, we could, you know, maybe Teddy can become the guy, but we're not going to advertise that for fear of uh, angering the, the masses who love Tua. But the Cowboys already are taking a look at Vaughn Miller. He's available. Chandler Jones is available. Jadavian Clowney's available. I mean, when he's healthy, and it doesn't happen very often, he can be as dominant as anyone in the NFL has ever been. But, you know, we see how important the pass rush is. And the Cowboys prioritized keeping Randy Gregory. And uh, the Broncos had their opportunity to snatch. I mean, look at the AFC West between the quarterbacks and the pass rushers. Holy crap. But the Cowboys had better find somebody, and there aren't a whole lot of options out there. And then uh, I, uh, a couple more minutes left with uh, Mike Florio here on the Rich Eisen Show. The Kyler Murray um, situation, his agent Eric Burkhart with the Jerry Maguire-like treatise uh, dropped during Combine Week. It's now Free Agency Week. What's going on there? Well, you, That's you, quiet. You gave me the tip last week that the Cardinals' images had been restored to the Kyler yes, Mur- Murray Instagram page, Take and around. I poked around to see what happened. It was an olive branch, and uh, Kyler Murray has been extending some olive branches to the Cardinals, but they are not yet extending the ultimate olive branch to him, which would be the contract that he wants. And if you look at Eric Burkhart's Twitter page, you will see that, that he – feels very strongly about what franchise quarterbacks are worth. And, you know, a few years ago, whoever was up next for a new contract at the quarterback position became the highest paid quarterback in league history. It was just you work your way up a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit there. Now there's a huge range. It's even bigger now than it was the last time we talked about this. you got Aaron Rodgers at new money average of $61.9 million, which is just mind-blowing. And you've got Matt Ryan at $30 million. That's $31 million between the number one and number 10 highest-paid quarterbacks in the NFL, where does Kyler Murray 
land. That is the crux of the problem between the Cardinals and Murray. Murray's coming in high, Cardinals coming in low, and we'll see if they can bridge that gap. And then the last time we spoke, we, we had uh, the TB12 heat check segment that I had just created the day before on the fly on the show, just like everything we do here. And so um, you said uh, that you put the heat check on him returning just at 11.99, right? Wasn't that what it was, Brockman? Was it 997. 997. You, you let yourself out of, let me, I don't know the math. What is zero, th- zero, 003. That's three one thousand. Three one thousandths of a percent. That's where you're out. And then sure enough, boom, he's back. So my question for you is, is certainly since you were thinking maybe the Niners for him, uh, what what about the idea that the Niners are just in on Trey Lance? What what what, what do you think? What, where, where where's all this stuff coming from about the Niners looking as you know a hot minute? They were interested in Watson yesterday and all that business before it got refuted. Well, think I think the about? reason why people wonder about Trey Lance is there was kind of an ambivalence last year about Lance. They created an expectation that we're going to see Lance more often, and they, they did that early in the season, and then they stopped, and we only saw him when Jimmy G was injured. And there's that broader question of, is he ready? And at one point last year, Jed York, the owner of the team, in an interview with Matt Mayoko of NBC Bay Area, said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but basically if we keep Jimmy G for two more years – and make a $50 million investment in allowing Trey Lance to develop, then so be it. So a lot of this traces back to the 49ers trying to set expectations a certain way, and and maybe they have. And I'm not 100% convinced that Jimmy G even moves on. I I think he will. I think there will be a market, a trade market for him, once we find out what happens with Deshaun Watson. But, yeah, it could be Trey Lance is the guy. I mean, there was – I think it was BetMGM had uh, a lot of action on Trey Lance for their MVP prop at a pretty high – you know, pretty high odds, but they, they've come down some uh, with the uh, the bets that were placed on Lance. That's kind of a surprise, a first-year starter. Uh, but but we've seen, you know what, look at the past several years. Second-year quarterbacks just come up out of nowhere and become MVP candidates. We saw it with Patrick Mahomes in 2018. We saw it with Lamar Jackson in 2019, both won MVP. We saw Kyler Murray in 2020 have some MVP buzz. So, you know, it, it's not out of the question that Lance could take the league by storm like some of these other guys have. Yeah, and Burrow made the Super Bowl last year. Yeah. You know? So, you know, and there's his second year, not first year starting, but um, pretty much. Uh, so before I let you go, uh, what stories do you want to drop here, little nuggets, little breadcrumbs from playmakers to, to let people know? I know, obviously, during the Super Bowl week, you, you threw out some, uh, some deflate gate uh, material. Um, and some Sean Payton to the Cowboys material. What do you want folks to know? Well, I don't know if we've talked about this. I don't think we have, and it kind of slipped through the cracks. Sean Payton spoke about this to GQ last month, and we wrote something about it on a Friday afternoon. How close the Saints came to drafting Patrick Mahomes and how different the world would be if hmm. Mahomes was a Saint. And it got so close and it was so awkward because Drew Brees walked into the draft room with friends as the picks were being made and as the Saints were moving in position to take Mahomes to the point where they had to go say, hey, Drew, um, there's a chance that uh, we're going to be taking a quarterback here, just just so you're aware. So they avoided the Aaron Rodgers problem, and ultimately they didn't get Mahomes. He went one pick earlier. The Chiefs traded up. But keep this in mind, and this is what's fascinating about the Saints' interest in Deshaun Watson. If Sean Payton was still there, the Saints would not be in on Deshaun Watson. They had their chance to get him with pick number 11 in 2017, and they didn't take him. I think this is a post-Sean Payton move. If he was there, this would not be happening. Was that, they, I remember that was in Philadelphia, and, and the Saints traded up, and we thought, like, that's going – we said it on the air, on, on the draft, with Mayock and everybody sitting on the set, this is Deshaun Watson now, right? And instead, I believe it was Marcus Davenport who they Lattimore. went – was is that who that was? It was Lattimore. They yep. went. They went up. The 11th pick. They went up and they 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 took somebody other than uh, Deshaun Watson, and we were all like, okay. And then obviously the Texans went up and got him, and the dominoes have fallen to the point where we are right now. It's but he would. I'm convinced Peyton would have taken Mahomes. If Mahomes had made it one more spot, because it, and this is. This is an example of what happens, and we talk about this, this in Playmakers. The smartest teams keep their mouths shut because once it starts to trickle out, that's when the draft experts start to hear it, and that's when guys get pumped up because 
when, nobody, nobody had Mahomes as a top quarterback. Nobody really knew who the top quarterback was in 2017. It was all very vague. Trubisky went first of all of them. But Andy Reid secretly loved Mahomes. Sean Payton secretly loved Mahomes. And another guy that I've heard secretly loved Mahomes, Mike McCarthy. But obviously he had Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. That's right. Hey, Mike Florio, thanks for the time. Congrats on the book. Look for my call again. Um, you know, and anytime if you ever want me to be uh, the home, the away of the home and home, I'll, I'll wake up early. You know. All right. Oh, it's very early. I know. It's very early. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I'll throw Wait, it out there. He's writing a check. Present rich is writing a check. No, I'm, future rich is not going to be happy. I don't know. That. I mean, I, I'm like, I mean, on the back end of the five a.m. Pacific hour, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm up anyway. I'm staring at the ceiling half the time. Don't worry about it. I'd All love right, to Rich. Do it. Take care of yourself. Thanks, okay, man. That's Mike Florio, present rich, writing a check. Future rich won't cash. That's funny. <laughs> Playmakers, where all books uh, can be acquired with yeah. Mike Florio, how the NFL really works and doesn't. Some great information and fun stories in there. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.